4 pounds of force. This is the smallest amount of effort someone needs to exert in order to end a human life. Equivalent to 18 newtons, or in more natural terms, a light flick of your finger. That's how easy it is to kill someone. War, perhaps one of the most fundamental events in human history, maybe even one of the most frequent, capable of changing the flow of history, driving technological innovations, and enabling some sick fucking trick shots. It is also, perhaps, the single worst thing that a person could ever experience. Get drafted, get trained, get under immense psychological and physical stress as you fight on the front lines on muddy trenches reeking of infection. Stand on your tiptoes and you may have all of your life experiences blown out the back of your head by a stray bullet. Keep your head low and pray that neither starvation or disease claims you. Or alternatively, charge onto the battlefield to prove your loyalty to a bunch of old guys sitting in a room somewhere and to a country that believes you will wait your life simply by having the misfortune of being born within its borders on a bad time. Lose your friends to machine gun fire, your house to bombardments, your limbs to grenades, all in the name of what, exactly? Kill people with friends and families whose only crime is wearing a different uniform from yours. I don't like to be biased in my videos, but I think you can see where I stand when it comes to war. War and violence, to an extent, are so prevalent in works of fiction because they are great drivers of conflict, which itself is the engine of a good story. But Violet Evergarden tells a story of the consequences of war and what it's like to be different. Needless to say that this video contains spoilers, so if you're watching this without having seen it, you know what to do. Oh yeah, one more thing is that I'm gonna have gameplay in the background because YouTube is a fucking cunt and it won't let me show parts of the anime. So yeah, enjoy the video. Violet is a war orphan and a child soldier. She was found one day abandoned in the Northern Front by Captain Dietfried Bougainville and given to his brother, Major Gilbert, not to be raised but to be used as a weapon. For reasons that are never specified during the story, Violet is terrifyingly good in the fight, capable of killing dozens of armed, trained men without even breaking a sweat at the age of 10. Her behavior is animalistic in the beginning, biting, growling and not even knowing how to speak in the first place, but in the army she is indoctrinated into something that better resembles a machine unflinchingly loyal and terrifyingly efficient. But it wasn't there to where she learned how to fight, as she is shown to have a talent for ending lives long before she even met the Major. Whereas Dietfried would treat her with cruelty and coldness, Gilbert was the first person who treated her with kindness, being patient, gentle, teaching her how to read and speak, and so on. But even so, she would still partake in the battles, oftentimes being the reason why his company managed to win in the first place. Regardless of the Major's kindness, she was raised as a soldier, thus her values, behaviors and beliefs are all tied to that central aspect. The environment we grow up in often shapes the rough outline of our worldview and behavior, and being raised in a war zone meant that Violet grew up as a loyal soldier and nothing more than that. That loyalty would eventually cost her both arms and plant a question in her mind that she will struggle immensely to answer. <laughs> These are words that, given the way she's been raised and conditioned, she couldn't possibly hope to understand at that point in her life. The transition of having her work as an auto memories doll stands in extreme contrast with her former life, going from a line of work that demands suppressing your emotions and being as objective as possible, to one where emotional sensitivity needs to be at a maximum and being too direct often compromises the whole goal. Auto memories dolls do more than just writing letters, they are supposed to embellish and polish the words of the sender and carefully put together a text that accurately translates their emotions into written language. This goes beyond just knowing grammar, as the dolls often need to interpret the sender's words and feelings. Human emotions are messy, and a common theme in the anime is that what people say is not always what they mean. I don't think I need to tell you why Violet would struggle with something like that. She has a hard time adapting to common society, as well as picking up on the subtleties of everyday interactions, doing things like snapping to a salute on the presence of any authority figure and being too direct in the wrong moments. This is one thing that I'd like to take a deeper look at, as I feel like the way she behaves has some pretty big parallels with neurodivergence. But bear in mind that this is just a little exercise in interpretation. I'm not a psychologist, I'm just a loser who sits in his room playing games all day. Among the everyday things that neurodivergent people struggle with is the ability to interpret and understand the subtleties of interpersonal interactions. Being on the spectrum myself, I found myself relating to Violet in quite a few situations. There are three scenes that I'd like to analyze having this context in mind. First we have the moment when she first meets Lady Tiffany Evergarden, who would be her caretaker, and the one she got the name Evergarden from. 
The moment Claudia introduces her to Lady Tiffany, the first thing Violet does is to salute her, just as she was taught in the army and just as she had to do every time she was introduced to an authority figure. There's also a moment where she very bluntly tells Lady Tiffany that she is not a replacement for the son she lost in the war, which is a piece of information that could use a little bit of euphemism. Finally, we have a moment when some lady shows up at the CH Postal Company looking for a doll to write a love letter for her, and Violet volunteers to do just that. The lady goes on about how there's this gentleman with an automobile company that is interested in her, but she wants him to chase her a little bit, saying that she isn't that interested and he's not all that attractive and his business hasn't popped off yet. But if he truly shows that he loves her through actions and gifts, then she would be willing to give him a chance. And Violet, being the good little soldier that she is, writes exactly that. I read your letter. However, I do not have feelings for you now. Furthermore, your commitment to love is insufficient to me. You should know, I am a complicated and serious woman, so please consider this. However, I fully encourage you to try again once you have procured proper gifts as well as funds. Is there some kind of problem with this letter? She technically did type exactly the information the woman told her, but she missed out on the subtleties, the body language, the voice tone, different things that would give away that she actually did have feelings for him. In all these three scenes, Violet is acting exactly in accordance with the way that she was taught to behave. She hasn't developed the emotional intelligence that would allow for her to read the room in each scenario, and so she resorts to simply doing what she was taught and what had always worked. A battlefield is not a place for subtext, it's a place where everyone needs to be as efficient as possible. There's no space for indirect or obtuse commands, an order is an order, and once given, it should be followed. There was never a moment in Violet's life where she had to use emotional intelligence. On the contrary, she was only ever put in situations that reinforced the idea that her actions should be done objectively and that commands should be interpreted literally. Having her write a letter for that lady is equivalent to using a chainsaw as a scalpel. On episode 4, she even goes on about how hard it is to understand other people's emotions when they're indirect or even outright lie about what they're truly feeling. Her difficulty with understanding the subtleties of human emotion isn't her only neurodivergent trait. Even at the end of the series, after a lot of character development, she never really loses her temperate demeanor and neutral expression. The only times we ever see her being expressive or raising her voice is whenever the Major is concerned, or during moments of particularly extreme emotional turmoil. This expressionlessness, when coupled with her machine-like behavior and of course her mechanical arms, has a lot of characters comparing her to an actual doll. An object that cannot act of its own accord, and only moves when someone is actively conducting it, just like her to an extent. In the beginning of the story, barring her interest in becoming a doll to learn the meaning behind the Major's last words, Violet is a surprisingly passive character. She only ever reacts to other people's actions, and only acts when given direct orders, which she will, of course, follow as literally as possible. This algorithmic behavior by Violet's part also contributes to another fascinating part of her character that I will explore a little later in this video, but being used and referred to as a tool in the army serves to dehumanize her in a very peculiar way, as she hasn't yet developed the sensibility to understand the weight of all the things she has done in the war. By the end of episode 1, she has this exchange with Claudia. You see, you don't realize yet, but your body is on fire and burning up because of the things you did. I'm not burning. Yes, you are. I'm not burning. I don't get it. The burning in the scene refers to all the guilt and trauma that she has suffered in the war, but that she cannot yet unpack on account of not really seeing herself as a person. She has yet to realize that she's been through a traumatic event in the first place, hence her curt response of, I'm not burning. Claudia, of course, knows that she is burning, she simply doesn't have the ability to feel that yet. It technically makes sense for her to not feel any guilt, both because she doesn't understand that concept yet, but also because she sees herself as a tool. Who does the killing? Is it the weapon or the person wielding it? Of course, Violet doesn't think that she's burning because in her mind she never did anything wrong. It was established that following the Major's and other officials' orders was always the right thing to do. Through that lens, she technically is guilt-free. But over the course of the story, she will eventually develop a sense of responsibility for her actions and the guilt that comes with it too. Teaching the whole spectrum of human emotions may feel like a Herculean task. How exactly do you teach something that is already supposed to be known by default? The way that Violet learns to become a doll is surprisingly coherent. She has the mechanical component down to an art, but her capacity for interpreting emotions is very much lacking. The solution? She goes to doll school, where we see an even greater display of her skills and flaws. Her grammar, typing speed and accuracy are on point, but the moment she has to write a letter for her friend Luculia, she once again makes the same mistake of being too objective. 
It's really interesting to see the contrast here. She is by far the most well-dressed and most doll-like of all the students, but to quote Luculia, her mannerisms are like that of a military soldier. She manages to be the top of her class and still fails to graduate on account of not understanding the feelings that go into the process of writing a letter. And you can see it in her voice and reaction that she genuinely doesn't understand what she could have done wrong. It is only later in that episode that she finally manages to get a grasp on how to translate someone's emotions onto words when she has a heart-to-heart -heart with Luculia. In this scene, there is no hidden agenda, no masked words or anything like that. She simply spills her emotions to Violet in a direct and honest way, and this is when she finally manages to understand it. Like Violet, Luculia is a war orphan. Her brother, Spencer, served in the army in a front that didn't see too much action. But while he was deployed, the western front was breached and her parents were never found. There is no right or wrong way to cope with grief, but Spencer blames himself for the death of his parents and has taken a liking to drinking to numb the pain. That habit has spiraled out of control and began to affect both him and his sister in a very negative way. You would expect a teenage girl with dead parents and a drunkard brother to be pretty much in the worst mental state conceivable, but she isn't. She still smiles and still works hard to become an auto memories doll, and she still tries to take care of him. What she explains to Violet is that, regardless of everything, she just wants to tell Spencer that she's glad that he's alive, but she doesn't know how to put that to words. This specific scenario is perfect to introduce Violet to the process of learning human emotion. She takes upon herself the trouble of writing a letter on Luculli's behalf to Spencer, simply telling him exactly what she told her. It doesn't need flowery writing or interpreting the subtleties of Luculli's voice tone or words. Her emotions are very clear, and even though the letter itself is rather concise and direct, Violet was capable of conveying the core message through it. Her emotions were accurately portrayed in simply telling Spencer that Luculli is happy that he's alive. It's not much, but it's a start, and it's the perfect intersect between the objective documents used to write in the army and the delicate emotional interpretation demanded of a doll. Each following commission she gets working as a doll will increase slightly in complexity until she's able to perform the role at a high level. One thing I noticed during my rewatch is how the displays of social cluelessness aren't exclusive to Violet, as there are several occasions where other seemingly neurotypical characters demonstrate a lack of emotional intelligence. In episode 4 we have an example with Iris and Violet on the train, where they both fumble the interaction they have with each other, but of course Violet remains blissfully unaware. The context is that Iris is complaining about having a broken arm and being unable to show off her writing skills to the people of her hometown, but let me remind you that she's saying that to a girl who's 5 years younger than her and that lost both her arms in the war and doesn't have any family or hometown to speak of. It's even a little funny because in this scene Violet's own antics end up making her look more mature than Iris. Another example would be Benedict, one of the company's couriers. A lot of the time he serves for the purpose of comedic relief as his casual nonchalant attitude contrasts a lot with the likes of Violet, but a good part of the altercations he's involved in comes from his inability to read the room or measure his words. For example, in episode 1 when Claudia is trying to find a sensible way to explain to Violet why she won't be able to stay in the Evergarden household, Benedict just straight up tells her that it's a problem because of her attitude. The struggles of these and a few other characters comes not from a deficiency in understanding other people's feelings, but rather from an incapacity to make sense of their own emotions in a cohesive way. In a way, their behavior is caused by an excess of a certain emotion rather than the absence we see in Violet. But naturally, over the course of their respective episodes, they eventually learn how to express their feelings and grow for the better, and of course, Violet learns a lot with them. Considering that she has as the core motivation of her character understanding what I love you means, she gets very good hands-on experience with all the supporting characters, and with every commission she takes she learns a new aspect about love. Sisterly, familial, romantic, fraternal, paternal, as well as all the other weird and complicated feelings that come with it, the joy of its presence and the pain of its absence, how it interacts with and persists after death. And one thing that I find really sobering is that even at the height of her popularity as a doll, after she's gone through dozens, maybe hundreds of experiences that each teach her a little bit about emotions and love, she never really changes her mannerisms. Both in the beginning and the end, she's still calm, patient, and maintains a neutral voice tone and expressions, as fundamentally those aren't really flaws that need to be changed. She becomes perfectly capable of not only feeling, but also showing coherent emotional responses, but her mild-mannered ways never really go away. Another aspect about Violet's character that I want to explore is her trauma. Being raised as a child soldier meant that she spent some of the most formative years of her life doing and suffering some of the most horrendous things conceivable. Living on a battlefield and taking multiple lives would leave an imprint on even grown-up hardened men, so imagine what it does to a preteen. Remember this scene where Claudia tells Violet that she's burning and that she simply doesn't realize it yet. 
This burning refers to what essentially is spring-loaded trauma that she doesn't have the emotional capacity to unpack yet. The first step to heal from trauma is acknowledging that it happened in the first place, but she doesn't have the ability to do something like that when the story begins. It is only after she's learned the meaning of love, and more importantly, the meaning of loss, that she is able to understand what she's been through. We see many times in a couple of flashbacks that Violet was superhumanly effective as a soldier. She was deployed on the battlefield with the specific purpose of disrupting enemy lines and breaking formations, and we see her effortlessly kill a lot of people. At that time, and in the beginning, her emotional numbness made it so that she didn't understand the repercussions of those actions. But during her time working as a doll, she comes into contact with a lot of people who have, are, or will soon deal with death. And she gets to see firsthand the utter devastation that it causes on the families, and by extension, the devastation that she must have caused to dozens, maybe hundreds of families who had their sons, husbands, and fathers slain by her hand. There are two moments in episode 9 that I'd like to analyze. Both it and episode 8 are dedicated to shining some light on Violet's backstory and the day that she saw Gilbert for the last time. To contextualize, after Claudia told her that he was missing in action, she went all the way to the ruins of the last battle and began to dig through the debris to find any evidence that he might still be out there somewhere. As she's returning from that excursion and processing the absence of the most central motivating figure in her life, Claudia tells her that she managed to survive and learn how to become a doll of her own accord, and that she can now live her life without needing the Major's orders anymore. And this provokes two realizations. First is that she has to come to terms with the fact that she no longer has the Major's guidance to help her. All her actions and decisions are of her own accord. Even though she technically did become a doll because of the Major, that was something that she did of her own volition, which is specifically relevant considering how complacent and obedient she has shown to be in the beginning. The second realization comes to her in her sleep. She has authority over her own actions, and with it comes the burden of responsibility. As she's dreaming, she realizes that during her time as a soldier, she killed dozens, perhaps hundreds of people. Sons, husbands and fathers that will never return to their loved ones. People just like the ones she helped as a doll. She's seen the pain that death causes, and she has to come to terms with the fact that she's inflicted that same pain in hundreds of families. Having this be so explicitly told to her in a dream by the person she looks up to the most basically results in her waking up and having a breakdown. And I want to take a look at this scene. We see her tossing aside a bunch of books and a lamp, things that are associated with her job as a doll, but when she picks up the toy puppy Claudia gave her, she is unable to throw it on the floor. She just gently places him on the ground and then tries to end her own life by choking herself. And when that doesn't work, she tries to call for the Major to ask for an order, trying to look for guidance in this abyss that she's facing. Now, this scene is quite hard to watch, mainly because the music choice is fucking weird, but after watching it a handful of times, I've come up with my interpretation of it. In the dream, Major Gilbert mocks her by saying that she's writing letters that bring people together with the same hand that took countless lives. Technically, it's not the same hands because she's using prosthetics. As in, it is absurd that someone like her would go from such a violent life to such a mild one, or in other words, someone like her is unworthy of learning love. Hence why she tosses everything associated with being a doll on the ground. But when she goes to toss the toy puppy, she can't, and I think that this is because she's finally developed empathy to a point where she is capable of personifying inanimate objects. Even though the toy puppy isn't alive and it won't feel pain, she can't bring herself to hurt another innocent thing. Hence why she just puts it gently on the ground. But all those emotions have to go somewhere, and she directs it to the only person left. The one who, in her eyes, is guilty of everything. Why should someone who has killed so many people and destroyed so many lives be worthy of being alive? The conclusion she arrives is that she isn't, so she tries to end it right there. But like I said earlier, that doesn't really work, and whether she likes it or not, over the course of the story, Violet has built a very extensive network of people who trust and care for her. The damage that death does is pretty much unquantifiable. Regardless of how much happiness and closure she has given to people while working as a doll, Violet feels that she can never outweigh the damage that she has done as a soldier. Now, my question is, should she be held accountable for those actions? This is a really complicated question to answer, and your take may be different from mine, but I lean more towards thinking that she shouldn't be held accountable for this specific scenario. Given the way she was raised, and the age she was at the time, and most importantly, the fact that she has never demonstrated any volition of her own prior to wanting to become a doll, I don't think that she can be held accountable. In every single flashback sequence we get, every action that Violet takes is either a result of a direct order or her trying to protect an authority figure, most often Gilbert, though that itself is a result of the unwavering sense of loyalty she developed to the one good thing in her life. But that brings up another uncomfortable question. Is Gilbert the one to blame then? He is the most prevalent authority figure in Violet's life and she is under his direct command. The orders to attack were given by him. 
If Violet really was considered a weapon back then, he was the one pulling the trigger. This certainly paints Gilbert in a pretty bad light, one that I don't even think the series wants us to see him in because Claudio specifically says that Gilbert not ever once treated or saw Violet like the weapon Captain Dietrich said she was. He only ever treated her like a human being, even if at the time Violet didn't see herself that way. Not to mention that there's a scene where he was given a direct order to deploy her on the battlefield despite his protest. I don't think that Gilbert is any more culpable than any other commandant would be in this situation. Of course, the correct course of action would be don't use child soldiers at all, but war forces innocent people to kill other innocent people they have nothing against, whether they like it or not. And given the awful situation the two found themselves in, he really did the best he could to give Violet as good a life as possible. There are even multiple moments when he is shown to be frustrated by Violet's machine-like attitude. Occasions when he directly asks what she wants to do and she just says that she wants to follow whatever his next orders is going to be. He goes out of his way to give Violet freedom of choice, but from my interpretation, there are two reasons why she doesn't take any action. The first would be because she was never really taught how to. Violet was nonverbal when she was first found by Dietfried, and given how combat apt and animalistic she was at the time, I find it hard to believe that she came from a normal family where she could exert her own will. The light novel specifically mentions that although she couldn't speak or understand human language, she did understand the order to kill. Regardless of whether she was an experiment or just some weird kid, Violet was never taught that she could exert will over her own actions. The second is that, at the beginning of the story, she already has all she needs, namely Major Gilbert. Being the first person to ever be kind to her and the one who gave purpose to her life, she might not have felt compelled to do anything because her primary objective was to make the Major happy, and a child's understanding of that would probably be something equivalent to following his orders unquestioningly. It is only after the person who dictated her life goes missing that she is forced to take ownership of her own actions, and she struggles with it as we see in the beginning. But that first action eventually comes, even if motivated by Gilbert, and it enables her to grow as a person much more than she would have had she never gotten separated from him in the first place. She goes from not even understanding language to having complete mastery over it, and she goes from not knowing what love and other feelings are to literally being the most condecorated professional in a job that is literally all about deciphering and understanding feelings. Spoilers for the final third of the movie, skip here if you haven't watched it, but Violet grew so much over the course of the story that when she is faced with the decision of going to see the Major, the one person her life has revolved around for the past 8 years, and fulfilling the promise she made to one of the clients as a doll, she is willing to abandon her only chances to Gilbert in order to fulfill the client's request, showing an immense amount of emotional development by her part. It isn't an easy decision, but she prioritizes someone else's feelings instead of her own, demonstrating the empathy that she developed over the course of the series. This decision is probably the top 3 most painful emotional moments she has ever had to deal with, but she goes through it willingly. Even if it hurts so much to let go of the one person she loves, that is an action that she takes out of her own volition, compelled by the respect and understanding she has developed from other people's feelings. There are so many things about Violet Evergarden that I love. How this world manages to be picturesque with every single frame, how it explores the whole spectrum of human emotion, how it shows humanity at its worst and at its best, but fundamentally it depicts trauma and healing in very sensible ways. And it shows that it's not one conversation or one step that will forever change your life, but rather dozens upon dozens of experiences over the course of your entire life, each one teaching you a little more, until eventually you can turn back and see how far you've come. It's not perfect, there are some issues with pacing and one or two artistic decisions that I'd rather decanonize, but none of that really matters if the story manages to get to you. The world became more beautiful after I've experienced Violet Evergarden, and I sincerely hope that the same happened to you too. Thank you for watching.